Hello, everyone. Welcome to Breakthrough, a Dale Carnegie podcast. My name is Faith Wright. I'm your co-host today, along with Neville DeLucia, and we are excited to be here back for another episode. Today, we have an awesome guest named Terry Mitchell. She has been a success in the technology industry as an executive and is now using her passions and energy, along with many lessons learned to enable college women in STEM. So she developed a program that we'll get more into today called Accelerate Success and partners with universities to retain women in STEM majors and prepare them to hit the ground running in college and post-graduation. So Terry, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I, I remember when we were talking a couple of weeks ago and I just loved your mission behind Accelerate Success and was hoping that you could touch more on um, your mission behind that now. Thank you, Faith and Neville. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be with you cool. this morning. And I always welcome a chance to talk about Accelerate Success. So the mission, why I'm doing this. So I spent over 30 years in high tech. And one kind of fun fact I do want to put out there is uh, a lot of people think, oh, it must have been terrible when you started, uh, which was, I graduated in 1985. Yes, I'm just putting it out there. But that was actually the peak for women's participation in comp sci undergrad majors, the peak at 37%. And then it just dropped steadily to uh, get to 18%. In 2018, the last time the stats were out there, it kicked up to a big whopping 19%, which takes us back to the raw numbers of 1986. So that those kind of figures, along with how I saw women's ability to fully participate in high tech or not, mm -hmm. really drove me to create Accelerate Success. So another stat, yes, I love to throw out stats. So thanks for <laughs> indulging me. 48%, this is both men and women, will select a STEM major going into college their first year. And 48% or 48 of those people who select STEM deselect STEM before they graduate. So that's almost half the people wow. that are in college deselect. And it's actually not, the stats aren't that different between men and women deselecting. What's interesting is women tend to stay in undergrad uh, institutions and men deselect and leave college. So I'd like to retain more of that 48% of the women because women dominate in bachelor's degrees, but it's only 36% with all STEM majors combined that they participate in STEM. So I'd like to try to keep some of those women who maybe are deselecting for reasons that could be addressed. Now, if they find their passion is accounting I can't imagine that, but there are people out there, then, then great, like let's support them fully. But if they're deselecting chemistry, comp sci, engineering, because they feel like they don't belong, that's something that we can address. Mm -hmm. So that's really the first part of the mission, help women stay in their, um, their STEM majors. I worked with a psychologist out of UMass Amherst, who has done studies on this, published papers, and the two critical factors for retaining women, one, that sense of community and belonging, and two, female mentorship. And she found that while mentorship is powerful, no matter what, for this goal, retaining women in STEM majors, female mentorship was the most impactful. Wow. Sure. Uh, so go ahead, Neville. Well, and I'm just saying, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm making notes here. And I think 
the 48% stat for me is quite alarming. And I have three daughters of my own, Terry. And one of the things as a dad, I want the very best for them. I want them to own their space in the world. And certainly they want to own when they go to college. What are some, what is some advice maybe you could share with parents that say, hey, you've got this child that's selecting to go into STEMs or into college in general, that they get number one, the right support, and number two, that they have conversations to say that they're studying what they want to study and maybe not what mom and dad want them to study. I'm not sure if that's a big thing here, but just, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, so a couple of things that you brought up there and all really interesting. So here's what I've seen on the transition and, and what parents can maybe do to help their student in the transition. So. STEM majors in college tend to be very high performing high school students. Mm -hmm. And some of them, frankly, don't even have put much effort in. They're just, it, it comes naturally, it comes easy. But that transition to being a first year student in college is not stepwise, it's a big step. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that. They, the parents have conversations about that. You, you don't seem to have to do a lot of work, which is, I'm not criticizing, it's just what it is. Just realize that going to college, it is gonna be more work. And that doesn't mean that this doesn't, or isn't a space for you. Just realize it's a big step for everybody, mm. not just you. The other thing I would suggest that if possible, the parents encourage their students to get involved in STEM communities in high school. So there's hackathons for high school students. There's different competitions, robotics, clubs, start them, uh, engaging in that. The other thing is, and you talked about owning your space, every discipline has its dominant personality. It's just how it is, right? Um, I don't fit the normal STEM personality. I'm an extrovert. Most STEM people are very introverted. So then if you have a child that is underrepresented for their gender or um, racially, it's even harder to find your voice. So mm -hmm. starting them in, in communities in high school will help them mm -hmm. be able to speak up for themselves. Devil, did I hit your points? That was great. I'm making that. <laughs> I think you're right. That underrepresentation does make it more challenging, right? Because mm -hmm. they're looking for like-minded individuals possibly and someone they can relate to and connect. Uh, just, just the honesty about the gap between being an accelerated or an, or excelling at high school that's that transition to college is huge I mean I remember Faith and I were talking about just what one of the people we were mentoring was was just sharing I've got to be on my own I've got to manage my own time the professor doesn't you know if I'm not in class uh, it's not a notification hey please come back it's like you fail in a grade and that's yeah. a massive massive ad adjustment so if we're mentoring these individuals how, how, how brutally honest should we be as their mentor and how do we do we need to hold them accountable at a different level so they get used to being accountable to just some insights from me on, on, on what you're experiencing so what i have found again we're talking the dominant personality so mentors and parents you know your uh, high school students personality if they don't fit into the dominant Mm. Some students tend to be pretty serious. They tend not to be the ones mm. partying till all hours on the, on the weekend. They just don't. But what they do tend to not be able to handle as well, so they tend to be able to handle their time okay. They tend not to be able to handle setbacks and failures mm. as well as other students because they just haven't experienced it as much so that's where I 
I think the conversations should center around. And mm -hmm. here's another thing that I've seen. So when you apply to university and they're all different, right? And sometimes you just, it, it doesn't matter what your major is. You're just applying to the college and you get into the college and you pick your major. Other schools, you have to apply to the individual school and maybe that's not to your junior year, blah, blah, blah. But uh, something I have seen that it causes a challenge. Let's say you really want to go into biology. You're a high performing high school student. You were accelerated in high school. You didn't, you took biology maybe 10th grade. Well, now that's kind of dusty. So as a parent or a mentor, you could say, I think we need to uh, refresh this before you even hit bio 101 in college, because that, that knowledge is a little rusty, right? You want to set yourself up for success right off the bat. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I just, just, just sharing what you're sharing. I'm thinking about some of the conversations I need to have still with my, with my other two daughters and some of the dialogue I need to be engaging on. I think that's something that, that's really important. Where, where did your passion for this come from, right? I mean, what, what made you decide to get into this initially and, 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 and line? I mean, you left tech, you said, right, to do this. Where did that passion come from? Well, you know? I love tech. So I love tech cannot believe it. it's been five years march 1st it was five years wow. of course with the pa pandemic in there so you know uh, that time is wonky for all of us right so i was always uh passionate about supporting women always mm. and when i was at ibm so i spent 30 years at ibm and i did a lot of things to support other women there, I was a vice president. So that position allowed me to have influence, which is a blessing. Mm. So I had 30 years. Um, it was a good time professionally to leave. I wasn't really sure what I was going to do next. And my daughter was getting ready to go to college. So I took about six, seven months off and just focused on her and that introspective, which honestly, I don't like introspective. I like just executing, just do, do, do. I don't like studying my navel, right? I don't like that. But anyways, during that time, I said, I have the ability to follow my passion. And this is my passion. And believe me, I don't have the whole world figured out, but I've made a lot of mistakes that maybe I could help somebody else avoid. And all that time, I can engage and impart some of the lessons I've learned with women. And because I was an executive at a large corporation, I saw things that I thought women were making mistakes. I thought the, um, the company was making some mistakes. Uh, and IBM is a great company, but I, so I'm not putting them down at all. The management team, so there's the helping women in these fields is very complicated, very multifaceted. I'm focusing on one. And the other thing that I read and I've seen is that women are 18% less likely to get the first promotion out of college into their new, um, their new career. They're 18% less likely. This is reported by McKinsey and Lean In study. Every year they put out the women who work or women in work, great resource. So if I could also help women understand some of those unwritten rules that because they're in a minority, they're not hearing those as much as men are. And some of those rules just, well, they were established by men and they, cater to men's natural personalities, not necessarily women's natural personalities. So if I can impart some of that, boy, and help somebody else, that's just like a blessing that I'm able to do that. Terry, I hear how much you want to impart wisdom and nuggets that you've learned along the way to younger generations. And man, that, that, that just speaks so much to my heart. So when it comes to 
mentorship and how you've cultivated that into your Accelerate Success program. I'm interested, I have a two-part question. The first part is who has been a mentor to you in this space? Maybe when you were working at IBM for several years that really imparted that wisdom, what was a piece of advice that she gave you as a mentor to you? And then the, the second part is what's the best piece of advice that you like to give to ladies that you're mentoring as well? Yeah, so my background, of course, I have had tons of mentors. I have had so many supporters and that is so important. And one of my first supporters at actually even, so before IBM, I started at GE and somebody that was in my class, she was someone who'd gone back to school. She was in my class in undergrad. She helped me get into GE. And then she was my team lead. And, you know, can I think about any exact information she imparted? Not right now, but it was just that day-to-day help showing me the ropes. Then when I went to IBM uh, and I first got into management, my manager was a woman and she, it was those unwritten rules that she would sit me down and, and, and talk to me about. So at IBM, I started off in New York and then after a couple of years, I went to Tucson, Arizona. And then um, my boss there who recruited me to go to uh, Tucson, he really showed me the ropes. And what's interesting, okay, I'm still in touch with those people regularly. Mm -hmm. They are life supporters. They weren't, they didn't turn out to just be career supporters. And you understand how things really work and then speak up, find your voice Mm -hmm. and Part of, they didn't say this to me, but always do your best. So if you overload yourself with work, you can't do your best in every setting. So do, do your best. That's how I met the person who helped me get to Tucson because I presented at this conference. That's where I met him. So do your best. You never know. The network is so, so powerful. So I got on a big roll and then I forgot the second point of, oh. Of your question. The, the second part of the question was what is one piece of advice that you find yourself giving to ladies that you're mentoring? Yeah, it's a two-part advice, but simply find your confidence. Find your confidence and self-promote. Women feel just it's not natural and they don't feel good necessarily about self-promoting. Find a natural way that feels good to you that you can describe your accomplishments. Women tend to downplay them. And if you downplay them, other people aren't necessarily going to contradict you and say, but you really did do good things. No, they're going to believe you that your average, you self-promote, competent self-promote. That's that's amazing that you share that. I think... We need to, you know, self, when Adele Carnegie talks about, you know, self-awareness is where self-confidence comes from. And what you're sharing is, is to say, hey, I'm good at this. And let people, you know, let that message get out there. And, uh, yeah. and I think that is such an important thing. I, mean, I know the focus is women in stands, but I'm sitting here thinking, man, everybody needs to hear this message of yours, Terry. Because we do have this, this, um, do I promote myself enough? How do I go about doing it? And there's a fine line between being arrogant and being confident, right? So you want to make sure that we are on that confidence zone. So just, just reflecting on that, maybe a follow-up would be, what are some of the things that I should be sharing or communicating so that I'm promoting my skill, my ability, or maybe my goals so that I can grow in an organization? Oh, what your, what nice. would your thoughts on that be? Sharing your aspirations is a form of self-promotion. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so all right, can I throw out one more tidbit because of my of course, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So have you guys do you guys follow Catalyst? 
I follow Catalyst. They do a lot of studies about women in the workplace as well. Mm. And they said that self-promotion is the one, number one engagement women can have to close that gender gap, uh, gender pay gap. Self-promotion. Again, multifaceted. And I don't want anybody to say, oh, we shouldn't put this all in women. Oh, 100% agree. But women, if you want to do something to help close that 79 to a one dollar, 79 cents to one dollar, self-promote. So people worry about, oh, I'm going to be arrogant. Self-promotion is fact and database. Mm. Arrogance is hype. Mm. So instead of saying, I'm the best around, you could say, I overachieved my first quarter goals. I set a goal at 10, I achieved 15. Mm. I'm really excited. Now that doesn't sound horrible, mm. right? It, that's good. Um, Self-promotion comes in the flavor of just letting your boss know what you accomplished and put it in context, put it in business impact. It could be a monthly email, five bullets. That's part of self-promotion. Yeah. Self-promotion comes in the flavor of thanking somebody for helping. Dear mentor, the advice you gave me, I followed it and I got the promotion. Thank you so much for your support. That's self-promotion, but again, it doesn't feel gross. It's, it, it can be natural. It can, again, be gracious to somebody that helped you. It's, I think it's such an important thing. And I mean, I just, just love these little bits of advice. So keep, keep bringing them in. This is really going to resonate with our audience. And, and, and what you're sharing are really, they really are great, great nuggets. Just, you know, before we like wrap up the session, maybe, if we could just ask, what was a breakthrough for you? If you think about a breakthrough that you had, and you think to yourself, man, this is where I got my break from someone, or this was the breakthrough that I had. Would you perhaps just share what that was for you in your career? And then, and then we'll bring this uh, to a close. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of different breakthroughs, some big, some small. The one I want to bring up is one is an assignment I got, frankly, that at times brought me to my knees, really and truly. Like, I remember coming home from work and just putting my arms and my head down on my center island in the kitchen and many times just crying. I was overwhelmed. I had taken on this very broad assignment, very multifaceted, and they asked me to come in and help when it was already in trouble on every single front, over budget, way behind schedule, huge technical challenges. And I'd never done something like this. And what was overwhelming for me was this, I'm a very responsible person. And so every time there was a problem, I just felt like, oh, I should have seen this coming. And of course, being proactive and, and heading things off is always good, but it's unrealistic mm -hmm. that I would have been able to do all of this, right? We finally shipped this product and we were, and it gave me a lot of visibility, of course, I learned a lot of how to give bad news up the management chain. I really did. And how to recover from problems and adjust and all this. And why I like to bring this one up is we had celebrations to uh, congratulate ourselves and the team that we shipped this product. And my boss said at one of the celebrations, stormy seas make great captains and that just oh, you're so right i learned so much going through those problems and dealing with it and overcoming them and mm -hmm. um helping the team get through them that that to me was a breakthrough not just professionally but personally and that kind of ties into what you said earlier about STEMs. I made a note here. Um, they need to, the STEM students that do really well at high school, they sometimes struggle with 
setback and failures, right? So what right. you're sharing here, resilience comes from these challenging times. And that is something that is so important for us. I mean, taking in all these nuggets of yours, and if if if, if people in our, if our listeners want to get a hold of you, um, what is the best way to reach out to you and maybe follow or connect with you in, in out there? What would you what, what would you say? Please share with so us. So look for me, Terry Mitchell, Terry with an I, on LinkedIn. Raleigh is my short URL. U R L, <laughs> and uh, love to connect. Love to hear from people. Well, I, I, again, thank you so much for just um, just just sharing your wisdom and advice and being so focused and empowering. A young woman in that STEM field. And, and I guess just it's going to make such a difference then. So thank you for, for listening to our podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to our podcast, please do. And please do. You'll find Terry Mitchell's details in our um, in this in this podcast recording. Please do reach out and do connect. And again, thank you for listening and joining us as we look at having an impact and making a difference by helping people find out how they could get breakthroughs by hosting these sessions. So Terry Mitchell, thank you for joining us. And Faith, as always, it's wonderful being with you on this, on this podcast. Thank you.